I think that a lot of women have these, I don't know, these preconceived notions of what they can do or what they're supposed to be doing. And I don't think those exist anymore. I don't think there's these gender roles, these gender specific roles nowadays. Anybody can do anything they put their mind to. And what I'd like to do is use what I'm doing to really inspire people to push past those boundaries, right? Especially because when you decide you're gonna do something, something big that you feel like it's totally right for you, everyone's gonna tell you no. That's not a good idea. You're not gonna make any money. And this is like, really, I wanna inspire people to push past all that. That's Mariah Kane, the 24-year-old CEO of Dragon Air Aviation, one of five finalists for the biggest Go Fly Prize of $1 million. In a moment, we'll be talking with Gwen Leiter, founder of the Go Fly Prize, and with Mariah Kane, both of whom I met at the final day of competition for the big prize. Hello again, and welcome to Aviation News Talk, a weekly show with relevant news and flying tips for pilots and student pilots to help keep you safe. I'm Max Truscott. Earlier this week in episode 140, I talked in depth about how the coronavirus is affecting aviation, including the airlines, flight training, and charter flight companies. And that show is even more relevant today than when I released it three days ago, so if you haven't heard it, you may want to check it out. And if you're new to this show, please click the subscribe button in whatever app you're using to listen to us now. That way you'll get notified when new shows are available, and it costs nothing to touch the subscribe button, so please do it now. Now let's talk about the Go Fly Prize. They recently held their final fly-off for the big million-dollar prize here in the San Francisco Bay Area, and I was fortunate to be invited to the final day held at Moffett Field, right where I live here in Mountain View, California. Let's talk first with Gwen Leiter, the CEO and founder of GoFly. Gwen's a graduate of Brown University and Harvard Law School, and she's also had a lifelong interest in aviation. Now here's our conversation with Gwen Leiter. I'm here at Moffett Field in Mountain View, California, and I'm talking with Gwen Leiter, who's the founder of the Go Fly Prize. Gwen, tell me a little bit about how you got interested in aviation. So I have always wanted to fly since I was a young child, uh, like millions of people around the globe. Uh, When I was younger, my sister and I used to make crazy contraptions and throw ourselves out of trees to see if we could fly. And that love of flight has never left me. And today we are at the Go Fly Prize final fly off at NASA Ames at Moffett Federal Airfield. And uh, it's very exciting to see our teams from around the world uh, showcase their their personal flyers. We've got an interesting background. A lot of folks in aviation don't come from a legal background. Tell me how you happened to transition into this world from having uh, gone to law school. So for me, there has always been a love of flight, and that really has continued on. And so when I realized that there was a convergence of breakthrough technologies that make it this first moment in history that we have the ability to make people fly, we were able to bring together a group of phenomenal uh, innovators and corporate Uh, partners and organizational partners to bring this uh, competition to the the world. So our grand sponsor is Boeing. Our Disruptor Prize sponsor is Pratt & Whitney. And we are joined by 20 different aerospace organizations, including AIAA and EAA and the Vertical Flight Society and the Royal Aeronautical Society in Great Britain and 3AF in France and Singapore Space and Technology Association and all of these groups and all of our corporate sponsors and our GoFly team have come together to support these teams around the world who are pushing uh, the envelopes of flight. You've done an impressive job of pulling together a lot of sponsors. What was the original spark for this idea? How did you come to decide that we should have a GoFly prize? So really, it was this this uh, convergence of breakthrough technologies. So um, some of them are things that you see every day, right? So it's the increased performance of the batteries and capacitors to make electric vehicles go further than then, faster than they ever could before. So to combine that with the uh, sensing and control systems of the drone world, and then of course 3D printing, 3D metal printing, other types of rapid prototyping, which open up this world of innovation to those outside the confines of a large corporation and put the tools to innovate in everybody's hands. And when you combine those factors and others, uh, it really allows the global builders and innovators and engineers to create something magical. And so that is why we have a competition where we have invited the world's best to be able to see what they can do. Tell me about how many people who have entered the competition and also about the mentor team that's been available to these teams. 
Sure. We have uh, 854 teams from 103 countries, comprising 3,800 individuals. With all of our teams, we have provided mentors, one-on-one mentoring for them. We also have a, uh, an enormous slate of master lectures, which actually can be found online uh, at goflyprize.com. So if anyone is interested in learning from some of the deities of aerospace on uh, aspects of propulsion and uh, safety uh, and electrics and, and all of those things, you may want to check out some of our master lectures. They are we have, We've made them free to the public. There are probably, I want to say, about 60 different lectures that are available now. So I think you're awarding the prizes today. Tell me what comes next. So we hope to continue to support our teams along the way. And we uh, would like to continue to have Go Fly prizes to spur innovation. That's great. Thank you very much for your time today and for putting Go Fly together. Thanks so much, Max. Truly happy that you're here. And we're thrilled to uh, be able to bring this technology to the world. Now, Gwen mentioned GoFly's online master lectures, and I've included a link to them in our show notes. And before we talk with Mariah Kane, let me tell you a little bit about the structure of the GoFly prize competition and some of the guidelines for designing a vehicle. The challenge consisted of three progressive payout opportunities spanning more than two years, starting back in 2017. In phase one, they awarded up to 10 $20,000 prizes that were based on a written report. In phase two, they awarded five $50,000 prizes that were based on revised phase one materials or for new teams, new phase one materials, as well as demonstrated performance of progress to date. And then for the final fly-off, they had one $1 million grand prize awarded for the best compliant overall fly-off score and a $100,000 prize, the Pratt & Whitney Disruptor Prize, awarded for disruptive advancement of the state of the art. The fly-off consisted of two phases, a technical inspection and a flight demonstration. Some of the parameters used for scoring included size, noise, and speed. The final flight portion included flying six laps around a one-mile course and loitering for over 20 minutes. In addition to the required maneuvers and the noise limitations, the final vehicle could be no longer than 102 inches, that's eight and a half feet, and had to be capable of carrying a payload of 200 pounds and traveling at a speed of at least 30 knots. Dragon Air was one of the five finalists. They hadn't heard of the GoFly Prize in time to enter Phase 1, but they did hear about it just in time to enter Phase 2, and they won one of the five $50,000 prizes awarded in Phase 2. And all five finalists were at Moffett Field to compete for the big $1 million prize sponsored by Boeing, which is where I spoke with Dragon Air Aviation's founder and CEO. And here's that conversation with Mariah Kane. I'm standing here with Mariah Kane from Dragon Air. Mariah, how did you get interested in aviation? Ooh, I started out in the hydro flight industry. So I started out doing extreme water sports, uh, specifically the jet board that attaches to your feet and has a big hose that shoots water out the bottom, connected to a jet ski. And then I met this inventor named Jeff Elkins, who built uh, this airboard, this personal flying device, looks like a drone, except for blowing up really big. And he couldn't get off the ground. He met me and was like, hey, you want to try flying this thing? And the rest is history. <laughs> That's great. Well, tell me a little bit about Dragon Air Aviation. How did you folks get started? Uh, so we started Dragon Air Aviation uh, about a year and a half ago to kind of put all of our inventions under. Uh, so specifically the airboard, what you saw here today. Um, we design and demonstrate personal vertical takeoff and landing aircrafts. Uh, everything we do is fully electric. We also have a battery company called Leap Lithium Energy and Power. So we're going to start powering all of our devices through that company. We basically, we are, we plan to show the world that these are safe, that anybody can fly them and kind of like sway the public perception so that they'll get used to seeing people flying. Right? A big part of anyone in this industry being successful is the public perception. Like, are these things safe? Like, is it really okay for someone to fly this to work? Right? So uh, we want to help push that along. And when did you get involved with the Go Fly Prize? And was that before or after you started working on these devices? I had been working on this for about two years before I found the Go Fly Prize. Uh, I originally heard about it, like, I when they first closed phase one and I was like shoot this is exactly what we're trying to do I'm so bummed I missed and then I moved down to Panama City Beach I decided to devote my life to the airboard and uh, I started building a company around it and I was looking for some opportunities some investors or where to take it and I, I was like what about that go fly price I looked it up and they just reopened and I had like three weeks 
to get all my paperwork in, build all these contracts and uh, enter in the prize and we got accepted and then we won top five in the world. So we've got $50,000 to go towards our next machine. And since that point, that was about a year ago, we've been just perfecting this machine to get here. And I know there are a number of different prizes. Which do you think you're in best position for today? Uh, so the only prize they're awarding today is the Pratt & Whitney Innovation Prize for $100,000. I think we have a great chance at winning it. This whole competition is trying to simulate people flying on air vehicles, and we're the only person actually flying on top of ours. Um, so I, th I think that we have it. I hope so. I don't know. No one's getting the million-dollar grand prize because nobody qualified for their challenge. So, yeah. And what's next for you and Dragonair? Oh, uh, well, all sorts of things. This is, um, we always say the airboard leads us. We don't lead it. So um, we're definitely open to lots of opportunities. We're, um, we're going to build 10. We're going to start training people on them. I'm going to start building a team of women flying on these things, and we're going to begin doing acrobatics. So uh, my, my vision is this uh, big, imagine like nit nitro circus, except for in the sky, right? Instead of the motorcycles, I have like hot girls on airboards doing flips and tricks in a big arena. And uh, I want to use all the attention we can grab and uh, re-channel it towards youth education and like education outside of schools and STEM programs and uh, especially girls' education, science and engineering, right? I feel like sometimes the school systems structure things to a point where um, children's brains are think that there's only one way you can do things. And we're all about using our imagination to inspire innovations and really push humanity to a better place. Do you think there are other future applications for the kind of vehicle you're developing? Absolutely. Absolutely. The biggest one is search and rescue. This can take off from the smallest space. I could, I could fly this thing in my bedroom. You know, it's, um, it's, uh, it can fly backwards. The helicopters, there's no other aircraft that can fly in reverse. And it's, uh, once we get the duration up, it's, it's going to be huge for that. You can get anywhere. Go ahead and describe the vehicle that you have here today and get as technical as you'd like. Okay. So it's an octocopter, right? Eight motors, eight propellers. Um, it's in an X8 configuration, which means they're stacked. So in order to fit inside the sphere for this competition, a 102 inch sphere, we had to stack our propellers on top of each other. So four on top of, of another four. Uh, I stand in the middle of it. I have a throttle in my right hand and a yaw stick in my left. So the yaw allows me to control my heading. The throttle obviously is up and down, how high I want to be, altitude off the ground, and the rest is just body movement control. So um, the flight computer, uh, interacts with me on the board. It's called our body position flight control system. And um, it provides a certain amount of pushback for how much lean I put in. So beginners, we can crank up the stabilizer and it'll be super stable. And experts, we can crank it down and it'll be super sporty and you can throw tricks. And I think one of the biggest challenges we have in aviation is we just don't have many women who are involved. How do you feel about that? And what do you think you can do to change that? Um, I think that a lot of women have these... I don't know, these preconceived notions of what they can do or what they're supposed to be doing. And I don't think those exist anymore. I don't think there's these gender roles, these gender specific roles nowadays. Anybody can do anything they put their mind to. And what I'd like to do is use what I'm doing to really inspire people to push past those boundaries, right? Just because, it, especially because when you decide you're gonna do something, something big that you feel like it's totally right for you, everyone's going to tell you no. I, that's not a good idea. You're not going to make any money. And this is like, really, I want to inspire people to push past all that. There's going to be a thousand setbacks, especially if you're doing something no one's ever done before. And it doesn't have to be something no one's ever done before, but anything that you desire, anything you can think of in your brain is possible. I agree with you about people telling you you can't do something. And I think they probably think that they're being helpful. They do think they're being helpful, but you know what? I'm, I'm all about following your heart and your intuition. And I would not be here today if I didn't stop listening to everybody else telling me what to do with my life and start listening to my heart. Wow. That's great. Any advice you have for other women who are interested in getting more involved in aviation? And aviation, uh, I say, go for it. There's so many resources for women nowadays. Um, it's scholarships for flight schools and, um, I mean, you could take it, you could even build your own aircraft. Look what I'm doing. This is the future of flying cars. <laughs> Honestly, just don't let anyone hold you back. Like, if you want something, go for it. Push hard. Um, it'll be worth it in the end. The, the things with the most challenges have the most reward. Tell me about your team. You had quite a crew of people here. Uh, how large is your team and what do they do to help you? Oh, my team is absolutely incredible. I have been pushing them so hard on this trip, and they have met every expectation and exceeded it. Um, they're... Um, they're amazing. They've all kind of just shown up. You know, we started this a year ago and it was just me and Jeff building these things. And uh, slowly we got an expert battery technician. We got a logistics guy. We got an analyst. And it's like these people have just came into our lives and fit these perfect molds. You know, I feel like if you set up the structure for something, everything else will fall into place. And that really is like 
deemed true with this team. Th across the board, they are absolutely incredible. And what are you going to be doing next when you get back to uh, Florida? So we got kind of a long drive to Florida, right? Uh, we check out of the Airbnb on the 3rd, so uh, we're probably going to stop along some beautiful lakes and stuff and do some flights on the way. Uh, the inventor wants to get his full flight training in, so now that we're done with this competition, we can play with the aircraft a little bit, right? And uh, so we're gonna, I'm going to train him on it, and we're going to do a bunch of flights on the drive home, and then we're going to start building the 10. That brings up an interesting question. Any kind of pilot license uh, required to fly this? No, right now we're under ultralight, so you don't have to have any sort of pilot's license. Yeah, just uh, the flight training I put you through, which could be a little intense, but it's quick to learn. <laughs> Probably takes a couple days. We're working on a uh, basically kind of like a simulator. So this thing looks like a giant drone, right? You stand, it's standing on a platform. Um, so you can stand in this, and with VR goggles, you can see where you're flying. So you can really get the experience of flight uh, as part of our training. And tell me some of the numbers in terms of, you know, how long will it stay in the air or how far have you flown with it? Yeah, so for this competition, we had to push to 30 minutes with a 200-pound pilot, which is very, very hard to do. And we barely made it on like a day when there was hardly any wind and everything was perfect, right? Because the more gusts of wind, the less battery you have. But I can fly on it for about 45 minutes. I'm 115 pounds, you know, so it depends on your weight level and the day. But uh, it can go pretty far, you know. We do most of our flights over water, so we haven't tried to go long distances yet. Uh, we stay over ponds or lakes so our safety crew can stay there. But once we get a lot of flight hours, we know exactly what could go wrong. There's still little things that pop up here and there. You know, this is experimental. Um, then we'll be able to take it on some journeys. Speaking of things that can go wrong, I understand that you had a bump with the vehicle uh, when you were at Half Moon Bay a couple of days ago. Tell me about that. Yeah, um, <laughs> that was a, it was a big shock for us, right? We came here, we had the aircraft dialed in. We were expecting to take home the $1.5 million. We were the only team that could complete the course. And we were doing our qualification flight. Uh, we started out with a low-level hover, and on like my fourth lap, uh, one of the ESCs cut out. And um, our board is self-stabilizing, so we can lose up to four of our motors and still fly. But I was weighted with an 85-pound vest because I had to be simulate a 200-pound pilot. And um, we hadn't had one of our systems cut out while I was weighted. And so um, having so much weight on my upper body toppled us over. So once it lost a little bit of balance, I was so close to the ground, it didn't have time to recover. And I hit the ground pretty hard, and I was pretty shook up after it. But I'm a quick healer, and we got back on the next day. So, well, so you lost one ESC, so I'm guessing you have one for each motor, eight of them. And so that meant one of your eight motors stopped? Yes. But normally that would be okay. We have videos of me of a motor stopping and me flying fine and not even knowing that it happened. But because of the vest, it got a little wanky. It's always something, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. It has been for sure. This has been the most challenging thing I've ever taken on. But it's also built a lot of confidence in my capabilities and the capabilities of my team. And now I feel like we could take on anything. Brian, you are quite an inspiration. Thanks so much for taking the time to talk with us today. Oh, it's my absolute pleasure. Thank you. <sighs> Now, I had great fun talking to Mariah, and I'm convinced she will go far in the aviation industry. I've posted some links to the Dragonair Aviation website and their Facebook page, and also to a YouTube video of a 17-minute flight of Mariah flying their vehicle a couple of days later on that long drive back to Florida. And you'll definitely want to check that out, so look for it in the show notes. As Mariah mentioned, no team qualified for the $1 million prize, though her Dragonair Aviation team apparently was the only one left that could have won it if they hadn't had a failure of an ESC, an electronic speed controller, of which there's one for each of the eight electric motors. But GoFly did award the $100,000 Disruptor Prize. And once again, here's GoFly CEO and founder Gwen Leiter announcing the results to the crowd gathered at Moffett Field. Hello all and welcome, welcome. We are so pleased that you are here at the final fly-off for the GoFly Prize. To all of our teams, well done! Congratulations! We have teams from 854 teams from 103 countries with over 3,800 innovators participating and all of them have day in and day out for two and a half years put their best into their personal flyers and into that grand challenge of making people fly. We are just so proud of you. Everyone joins me in saluting you and to thanking you so much for everything that you have done. We have been blessed to have been supported by the Boeing company. They have done everything 
in their power to help our teams. They have been the most wonderful grand prize sponsor and our grand sponsor of the entire event. And I am so very pleased to welcome to the stage Boeing's chief engineer, Dr. Greg Heisler. So, our teams have been working for two and a half years to try to capture that $1 million grand prize. Unfortunately, that did not happen today, but our teams are so close. They are so very close to making the impossible possible that we together have decided that that prize is still open. That prize is still up for grabs. I said the other day in my remarks, you know, that we, what we do in aerospace is really hard. All these teams can attest to how hard this is, but that's why we love it so much, because it changes the world. So I want to tell all the teams that prize is still out there. We want you to continue to go for it. We look forward to our continued partnership with GoFly. We'll change the world together. Thank you. GoFly is also so pleased to have Pratt and Whitney as our Disruptor Prize sponsors. Right now, I would like to call up the Senior Vice President of Engineering, Jeff Hunt, and members of his team who have been instrumental in helping our teams, in supporting them along the way with mentors and master lectures, and to helping us give the Disruptor Prize. Thanks, so, and Pratt Whitney, as we look at the Disruptor Award, Clearly, we're looking for the most innovative ideas that we can find, and we're looking for balance because everything we do in the aerospace industry starts with safety. So, this I'm going to read. We designed the Disruptor Award to recognize the team that challenged the status quo, delivered unique thinking into a complex issue, and considered safety, reliability, durability, and system integration. I'd like to thank my colleagues, Frank Prelli, Troy Prince, Zubair Bay, and Amanda Boucher for the time they spent reviewing each time team's entry. And we're proud to announce, after careful deliberation, the winner of the $100,000 Pratt & Whitney Disruptor Award is Tetra. <laughs> I should have said, I'd like to invite you up to collect the award. <laughs> team Tetra Tasuku, come on up. The whole team, come on up. You deserve it. And our congratulations to Team Tetra for winning the $100,000 Innovation Prize. Tasuku Nakai is the design team's captain. He's a doctoral student in the Department of Mechanical Engineering at the University of Tokyo. Their VTOL has a motorcycle-style seating arrangement placed on top of a folded-up quadcopter airframe in which the four fans are not parallel to the ground, but they're bent out at an angle from the ground. And I'm guessing they did that so they could use larger propellers while still staying within the 102-inch maximum size for the vehicle. And let me briefly mention the other three teams who were among the five finalists in the final round of the competition. In addition to Dragon Air Aviation and Team Tetra, the other three teams were J.U. Ray, 
which had a 250-pound unmanned vehicle designed by an MIT team led by Ben Sensa and Sujay Jung. Aria, which was built by the Texas A&M University Harmony team, led by team captain Dr. Mobile Benedict, who's an assistant professor of aerospace engineering. And finally, Team Verticycle with its electric jet bike. In that vehicle, all four fans are parallel to the ground, and the operator sits in what looks like a fairly comfortable chair on top of the vehicle. And Pete Bittar is their team captain. And finally, our congratulations to all five finalists, as well as to the hundreds of other teams that entered earlier phases of the competition. Well, longtime listeners know this is a listener-supported show, so please check out our Patreon site and consider supporting us. I try and add a few new supporters every month because we lose a few supporters each month when people don't update their credit card or drop out because of change in their finances. So if you find value in the show, please sign up to donate a few dollars each month via credit card by going to our Patreon site at aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome, since you're all awesome listeners. Or you can make a one-time or monthly donation via PayPal by going to aviationnewstalk slash PayPal. And please take a moment to show your aviation friends how they can get the Aviation News Talk podcast. And if they don't know what a podcast is and surveys show that 50% of the population doesn't, just send them to the Apple App Store or the Google Play Store where they can download our dedicated Aviation News Talk podcast app for iOS and Android. In the App Store, just search for Aviation News Talk. And yes, of course, those apps are free. So until next time, fly safely, have fun, and keep the blue side up.